Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about the Kansas-Nebraska Act and how this act led to the rise of the Republican Party. Here are your goals. You should be able to answer these six questions by the time you're done watching the video. Alright, so let's get started with some background information. Um, so as you learned in the last couple of videos, um, by the early 1850s, slavery had been growing more and more unpopular in the North. And two things that had led to this were um, the Fugitive Slave Law, which came around as the compromise of because of the Compromise of 1850, where the Southerners could basically kidnap free blacks from the North and transport them back south because they accused them of being uh, escaped slaves, and also because of the publication of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which um, was kind of like the best seller of all time, especially in the North, and basically showed everybody exactly how terrible slavery really was. And because of these two things, the Northerners were starting to really dislike slavery and didn't want it to spread any further than it already had. But um, in spite of this growing tension between North and South, uh, things are still held together for the most part. And the main reason for this is that the two main parties, the Whigs and the Democrats, don't make slavery a key issue. They sort of just avoid talking about slavery. But this is all going to change because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, which is going to force the spread of slavery to become a major issue, and is going to lead to the split of U.S. politics between anti-slavery in the North and pro-slavery in the South. Okay, so let's talk about where this Nebraska-Kansas bill comes from. Um, the main root of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is um, manifest destiny, basically the idea that the United States should spread across the continent all the way to the Pacific. So this has sort of already happened with California coming in as a state, but um, the, the western coast is still really separated from the east coast because it's not really easy to get to it. You either have to take a wagon all the way from, like, Iowa to California, which is not easy, or you have to take a boat all the way around South America to the West Coast. Um, and so a lot of people, in order to connect California to the rest of the country, want to build a railroad, a transcontinental railroad. Just That means just a railroad that goes across the continent. Um, and so most people agree that a railroad like this would be a good idea, but there's a big problem, and that is that if you wanted to build this railroad, it would have to go through um, a lot of unorganized territory, and it seemed like the best route for this railroad was through northern unorganized territory that would legally have to come in as a free state because of the Missouri Compromise that happened way back in 1820. Um, but so anyway, the main leader for the uh, for this kind of railroad that would basically connect Chicago and San Francisco by going through the free territory in the north uh, was Stephen A. Douglas, and um, he really wanted the the railroad to go through Illinois and to end in Chicago because he was a senator from Illinois and he also owned a bunch of property in Chicago. So it was kind of a selfish move on his part, but he really wanted this railroad to go through. But he also knew that Southerners would never accept um, this plan for a railroad because it meant that more free states would get added because people would move to where the railroad went and it would lead to these areas coming in as free states, which would tip the balance even further towards the free states in the Senate. So he comes up with a plan to make the southern states happy with this kind of railroad. The plan is called the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and Stephen A. Douglas comes up with this and basically forces it through the Senate using his um, his power and his control over other people in the Senate. Um, and so basically the first step was that they would get rid of the Missouri Compromise. And if you guys remember way back, the Missouri Compromise said that slavery would be illegal in the Louisiana Purchase north of the 3630 line um, 
which you can see drawn on that northern map there, it's basically the southern border of Missouri. So nothing would be allowed, n no slavery would be allowed in the Louisiana pur Purchase north of the southern border of Missouri, except of course for Missouri. Um, but so basically, Stephen A. Douglas wants to get rid of this, and he's going to change it so that slavery would be allowed in the Louisiana Purchase north of this line. And what that would mean uh, would be that as these territories filled up with people, the people would be allowed to vote whether they would be a slave state or they would not be a slave state. Um, and so that was the main idea of the Kansas-Nebraska Act. And then what they did after they changed it, so that way the people could vote and slavery could possibly appear in these territories, is they split this big unorganized territory, as you see it called in the top map, into two different territories. Um, one territory, the northern one, is called the Nebraska Act, and people assume that this area is going to fill up mainly with northern settlers, and it will become a free territory, or a free state, and that the southern part, which they call Kansas, is going to get filled up with southerners and become a slave state. And so they think that this division will lead to a continued balance between the free states and the slave states and prevent any sort of war or secession crisis or anything like that. That's the plan. In practice, it doesn't work out like that. All right, so there are a lot of problems that result as uh, out of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, and we're just going to talk about some of the most immediate ones today. First of all, um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act gets passed in Congress, and it's supported both by Whigs and Democrats, which is important uh, to remember. And so Southerners are super happy with this deal because it looks like they had been able to basically get another area open to slavery. Before the entire Louisiana Territory, north of um, the 3660 line, had been illegal to slavery. But now, because of this new deal, it was open to slavery, and they would probably get at least one more slave state. Northerners, though, were super unhappy about this, because they thought that they were allowing slavery to spread into territories that were meant to be free, and they thought that this was really bad because abolitionism had become more widespread in the North during the early 1850s. So Northerners felt unhappy and cheated. And because of this, the Northerners rejected the Whig Party. And this is because they felt like the Whig Party had basically sold them out to the South, and the Whig Party starts to lose votes and basically begins to fade out of existence. There's a picture there of Stephen A. Douglas, um, and he's the guy who got this Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, passed, and who accidentally killed the Whig Party in doing so. The decline of the Whig Party is a huge deal. Um, the North basically totally rejects the Whig Party and the Democratic Party because they don't want to vote for a party that's okay with slavery and okay with spreading slavery to new territories. Uh, the reason for this is that slavery had become more unpopular in the North and that they didn't want to let it spread anywhere else. And so what happens because of the Kansas-Nebraska Act is the Whig Party breaks down and Northerners start to look for a new party to vote for. Um, in the election of 1854, where they're just electing people to go to Congress, nobody's getting elected to be president at that point, um, the North elects a lot of candidates who oppose slavery and the Kansas-Nebraska Act and who want to bottle slavery up in the South and slowly get rid of it. These guys, once elected, group up to form a new party called the Republican Party. And what this means is that the country is now divided into a northern party, um, and this this is the Republicans, and they are anti-slavery. They want to bottle up slavery and eventually get rid of it. And then a southern pro-slavery party, and this is the Democrats. And so this is a huge problem, because now the North and the South are divided, not only in terms of their culture and their economy, but they're divided politically. The North votes for the Republicans, the South votes for the Democrats. And what this means is that if the Republicans are ever able to win the presidency, it could lead the South to secede from the Union. Because if the Republicans gain power, they might try to get rid of slavery. And the South is terrified that that will happen. 
And so this is a huge deal that's eventually going to lead to Abraham Lincoln being elected in 1860 as the first Republican president and is going to lead South Carolina and then the other southern states to secede from the Union and that's where we're going to get the Civil War. Um, so this is kind of the beginning of the end of the peaceful Union that we've seen going from the end of the Revolutionary War till 1860. So we're going to hear a lot more about this and we're going to see that guy over there on the right, Abraham Lincoln, grow a beard and eventually become president. Your goals, thanks for bearing with me, and I hope this is all clear and somewhat interesting to you guys. I will see you tomorrow.